Hello, friends. Welcome to the Wake Up With Gratitude podcast. I'm your host, Julie Boyer, and today I'm bringing you an amazing woman, Jill Levine. Good morning, my friend. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited uh, to meet you. We were introduced by our mutual friend, Beth, and she said, you have to have Jill on your podcast because she has an incredible story of healing and of transformation. And of course, those are the kinds of stories that I love to share with our audience. Now, Jill is a certified professional motivation coach. She teaches resilience and mindset transformation. And she had an incredible 15 year career as a senior HR recruiter and career coach. And shortly after she landed her dream job at LinkedIn, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer at age 38. Now, what I love about Jill is that this is not just a story of survival. It's a story of resilience. It's a story of mindset and it's a story about gratitude. So Jill, I know I've given away the punchline, but that's, I know that's how you present yourself on all your websites and everything. Cause I think that's a huge part of your story. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, the time before you had cancer and a little bit about your career and how you got into being an HR recruiter. Okay, sure. Um, so I actually fell into it by accident. I, I literally, I graduated college. I did not know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to be with people. I'm a people connector. And I went to a headhunter. I went to the headhunter in hopes that they would place me someplace. After four hours of being passed around to everyone who worked there, the owner comes out. She said, we want you here. We, oh. we want you to be a headhunter with us. And I said, okay, what does that mean? And she explained it. I said, okay, I had no idea, but it sounded good. I took the job. Um, I was a headhunter for five years, meaning I was doing talent matching, you know, in, into corporate America. And then I said, you know what? I was working only on commission. It was very, 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 very stressful. Yeah. I said, I want to do this, continue to do this, but I want to do this on the other side. So I became a corporate recruiter. I loved every minute of it. I was recruiting for probably about 13, 14 years. And then LinkedIn had heard about me and they came knocking and they said, we need you over here. So I said, okay. So there began my journey. The irony in that journey is because I was a consultant for all those years, I had very poor insurance. I had insurance, but it was very, very small. I, I was paying out of pocket. And within two and a half weeks of my starting my dream job at LinkedIn, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer and needed millions of dollars worth of benefit. So that to me was the universe. And therefore wow. I'm always in gratitude. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I should mention. So I'm here in Canada. Jill is in the U S where healthcare, especially when you're diagnosed with cancer becomes a very, you know, expensive situation. And of course, the last thing you want to be thinking about when you need treatment for cancer is going into millions of dollars worth of debt. So that's, yeah, I can see why you would, you would feel that that's an alignment of bringing the universe together. But did you see that at the time? Like when, when you got this news, like, had you been feeling unwell? Were things just not going okay? Like, how did you end up sort of at the doctor in this situation where, you know, you just started a brand new job and all of a sudden you're sick. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I love to educate the world because I miss the signs that everyone would miss. So prior to my starting, I, I'm going to say about two months before I started, I was still working um, at, I was at Unilever at that time. I had really bad back pain. I was very itchy. I was itchy from head to toe. And it's a type of itchiness that cannot be soothed. I would take boiling hot showers or freezing cold showers. I would start to bruise. I would start to bleed. I went to dermatologists. I changed my you know, perfume, deodorant, everything. Um, I did not know that that was the number one sign of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I thought I was having an allergic reaction to who knows what. Yeah. I also had one night sweat meaning, and I don't mean just mean when you're hot and a true night sweat is when you sweat through the sheets. I had one of those, but I thought I was hot. I don't know. It, it just didn't dawn on me that I was already at stage two or stage three by that point. And these were the signs. So it's not to make people nervous and say, oh my God, I'm itchy. Do I have cancer? It's something to be mindful of. If you have uncontrollable itchiness, 
um, it's something to look at. And the so bruising then, too, right? I'm, I'm sure the bruising is a sign, um, can be a sign. Only, I was only bruising from scratching so much. It wasn't, oh my gosh. I was just so itchy that I would, you know, wow. scratch myself. I could. So that's where the bruising came in, but it wound up being in tremendous pain, which drove me to the doctor to get an MRI. And within that MRI, I had all these tumors. I had cancer from head to toe in all of my bones and in all of my organs. Oh my gosh. And that's what happens with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It, it gets you with a vengeance. Okay. Well, we're looking at you today and you're like vibrant and full of life. So I don't know, like that sounds like it doesn't sound good. Like that sounds like you might not make it. That sounds pretty awful. So what, what was the prognosis when you first found out that you had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in stage four? Like, again, that sounds really bad. It is bad. Um, listen, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is very curable as okay. aggressive as it is. It yeah. happens to have a very, very high cure rate. Okay. Having said that, I was told when I showed up to Memorial Sloan Kettering, I may have waited too long. They did not know, even though they can get most, mostly everybody, right? They can cure everyone. They just didn't know that would be my story because I was so far gone. I showed up with 104 fever. I was paralyzed. Um, they had to take me one block via ambulance because things were really, really bad. And I literally did show up on my deathbed. If they could stage it further, it would have been staged like stage nine. There's no yeah. such thing, but, you know, in theory. Yeah. Um, so there began my treatment and more importantly began my mindset treatment, which to this day, and we'll talk about it in detail shortly, but to this yeah. day, I will always believe it was that superior help that actually got me to where I am. Well, and that's, you know, what really obviously intriguing me about your story is that you did the, the treatment that you were assigned by the doctor and you followed that. And what was it that guided you or prompted you to say, I'm going to do the work here as part of my healing? Was it something you'd learned through your work? Is it somebody that suggested something? I'm just curious as to where that came from. Well, I'm a holistic person. So to hear that I was going to, I was more afraid of the chemotherapy than I was of the cancer itself. The chemotherapy, I had known chemotherapy kills you. Even if you had a fighting chance, many people die because of the chemo. And the chemo unfortunately kills all the good cells that we need to survive. So because I'm a holistic, I'm also a researcher, right? Just by nature, uh, that's my hobby. So I started to research how to combat the chemotherapy and it led me down this whole road of what to fill my body with, to literally replace all of my cells. So it started just being a healing process of eating, but in that eating well and understanding the different roots and the different foods and spices and everything, it started to help me then say, okay, I feel like I'm in control. I started to digest a tremendous amount of information about how do you create happiness and mindset shifting when you're in the depths of hell, so to speak. And I literally created these step-by-step -step techniques. So what, what did that entail? Um, I went to Reiki twice a week. I did acupuncture two to three times a week. Um, I was drinking um, uh, white vinegar. I was eating turmeric. I was putting cinnamon on everything. I was walking and walking and walking. I was making sure that I was in nature, looking up at the sun, listening to music. All these things change chemicals in your brain. Mm -hmm. And I had all these different mantras and I would play brain tricks with myself until I actually believed it. So it's not something you could just Google and say, oh, I'm gonna try that. It was a discipline that I did every single day and I wound up 12 weeks later, my cancer was gone. That, that sounds extraordinarily fast. Extraordinarily wow. fast. So that the doctors did not believe it. They, they, you know, I had a line of doctors outside yeah. my suite waiting to shake my hand, looking at my scans, one that's all lit up like a light bright board, which is all the cancer. And then the second one, 12 weeks later is black. And the irony is when I told my doctor, 
doctors that I was going to go in this entirely Eastern medicine, you know, to combat the chemo, they said, we're going to kick you out of the, out of the trial if you do that. And I ignored them. So this is a point that I, I wanted to just touch on is that there is, so because I work in holistic health, nutrition, well-being, um, and I've had worked with a lot of clients that are going through or been through cancer treatment. And a lot of them have to, are told to not work with me during that time, sure. right? Not okay. Don't mess with the chemo, even though, like you said, the chemo is really, it's killing you. It literally is killing you, but it is the best treatment we have right now from a Western medicine standpoint. So we're not saying not to do that, but what you're saying is you decided so what was that like? Like you, so you're like, yep, yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you just go off and do your own thing anyway. Yeah. And well, essentially that is, yes, that is what happened. But what the process was, oh my God, I can't do everything I want to do. I can't do it. And then something happened. I looked in the mirror at one point and I said, Jill, you are the CEO of your own body. Mm -hmm. These doctors don't actually care. You are just a statistic. They don't care if you, now you've got long-term effects and if the cancer comes back again, they just care that they get this cancer now so their numbers go up. I was very clear on who I was as far as like a specimen to them. I also knew being depressed and having anxiety, that would have killed me also. So I, I lied to them. I told them I was not taking, you know, every week when you go in, you have to tell them what vitamins you're taking. And they would always say just the multivitamin that you told me to, but I was taking 22 different pills that I... I went to Whole Foods and I spoke to the head of the, um, you know, the vitamin aisle and he happened, he's an 88 year old guy, very knowledgeable. And I said, I'm taking chemotherapy. What can I take? And I literally bought everything and I took everything religiously. Yeah. And it's, this is, we just want to be clear that we are not giving medical advice here by <laughs> any, you know, we're no. sharing your own personal story. Right. And, you know, what this is your personal story of how you dealt with your cancer and how your body came through in 12 weeks through your resilience, your work, your nutritional supplements, the way you took care of your body. Everybody is different and everybody has that. We do all have the option to choose who we listen to and who we don't. And for some, um, the doctor is all that. I mean, I, I, I have a client who the doctor would say, don't take this, this, and this. And he's like, uh-huh. And then would, you know, take care of, and it's tricky because this, this kind of treatment is always changing and always moving, but it's very, very powerful to see how you decided, you said, this is my body. I'm making the decision and you did something really incredible that surprised him. So then now you get to 12 weeks and the doctors are like, are they like, oh, it was all the chemo or how did that conversation go? So, well, it's funny you say that. So I still had, even though I was cancer free at week 12, I was, I still, as part of the trial, had to go through two more chemo treatments. Oh, so week 12 to 17, that's when I upped the antes. That's when I started to take more and more and more because the second set of tre uh, treatment was going to be very, very, very toxic. And I knew that people were not surviving that. Um... I still did not tell them. However, on my last appointment, I told them everything. And they were stunned. They weren't happy, but there was nothing that they can do. I, I, I minimized it. I said, listen, I wound up doing a couple things. I didn't tell them everything that I did. I kind of just made it look like I was more reading and just doing research on like meditation and, and stuff like that. But the truth is I wound up reading some books written by oncologists who left all the top cancer hospitals to who became holistic yeah. and I had their voices in my, in my soul. And I knew that sometimes I looked at the, my doctors and I looked at the chemotherapy as my enemy. And yet I needed that enemy to survive. So it's, it's a, it's a very weird balance. Yeah. And it sounds like it would definitely be challenging on your mindset to be, you know, every time you show up for chemotherapy, you get told one thing and in your heart, like you said, you were hearing these other voices in your soul and in your heart, and your mind, you're like, but I know differently and I've heard differently. So what kind of um, mental, like, would you, did you have like mental preparation that you would do every time that you went into treatment? No, the, it, it, it no, I okay. literally said, keep your mouth, keep your mouth shut. Just okay. say yes. Yes. Wow. Thank you for the chemo. I knew, I, I knew it was a chemo, you know, chemo factory, so to speak. I, I yeah. got it. You know, I knew that. I just never said anything okay. until the 
very end. And I only said it because they were in such disbelief. And I said, well, guess what? I think I helped us along with everything you said I should not have done. Now let's talk a little bit about gratitude. So gratitude is a tricky one because actually you mentioned right away, one of the things that, you know, you had great, you were grateful for was that you had just started this new job that gave you the insurance that you needed to, to be able to go through these treatments. And you said you were in a trial, which I imagine those are even more crazy expensive when you're part of a clinical trial. So what other ways did gratitude show up? Not only through the process, but going forward, right? So, uh, this was a number of years ago, right? That you've, you went through this. Yeah. So now, so how does gratitude fit like during the process? And then from that point forward, you know, this being cancer free, what does that look like? You know, gratitude is something I, I have to practice. It does not come easily. So through the treatment, I was just so thankful that I'm alive. I knew it was working because I was feeling better. All the pain was subsiding. So I knew I had a physical you know, proof that, that it was working. So I was always feeling grat- grat- uh, gratitude. And I was looking at my four-year-old at that time. And I just was full of, you know, this is going to work because I'm going to make it work, right? And, and I don't know, listen, I'll never know how much that helped or didn't help it in my mind. And I'm allowed to be in control of what I believe happened, right? And that of keeps course. me in control. Yeah. So yeah. when it comes to today, though, it's difficult. It's hard. I, I have to look around. I have to write and journal all the things that I love about myself. You know, I have a brag board uh, in my coaching business. I have, it's just a sheet of paper, but it's literally a brag board where I have learned to say all the things I love about myself and that I'm so happy about. That doesn't mean that there aren't areas of that I need to improve. Of course there are, but I concentrate first and foremost on the good parts about me. I love that. And that's often overlooked as like, you know, just being grateful for the things about us that we love, because I mean, this whole project for me after the podcast actually started as a self-love project because I was struggling with my own self-esteem, self-worth and all that. And I was interviewing people to learn what they did for self-love. So that's actually cool because that's another thing that I've not heard of this brag board idea. So is it like a notebook that you keep or is it something on your phone? Oh, listen, yes. And yes. And yes. It's wherever you're going to look at it. So I happen to have a big whiteboard and I've got fluorescent color stickies that say different amazing things about myself. Um, By my computer, I've got, you know, a big screen and small screen. I've got stickies of how great I am and that um, I don't have imposter syndrome. I belong here because I have a lot of good information. Um, I literally will look in the mirror and I'll say, even if I'm not feeling great, and that's the, that's the irony, even when you don't really feel it, I still act it. Mm-hmm. I become an actress. So I might be up four pounds, but I say, you know what? You actually look really good. <laughs> you look terrific. And the thing is, the more you practice these things, the actually the easier it is to believe yourself. I know at the beginning it might seem like it's really hard to believe yourself, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. So uh, you recover from cancer. Now, did you end up going back to that job at LinkedIn? I did. I wound up staying there for eight years. Oh, okay. But recently, you are doing- recently yes, yes. So so since so since LinkedIn, I wound up uh, going to another startup and. I realized so many people would come to me and say, Jill, like whether it was cancer related or they're going through a divorce or they're just in, you know, in a tough spot, you know, I have this positive way to look at things. I don't know. Sometimes I call it a sixth sense, but I can see through someone else's pain. So I said, you know what? COVID hit. I was not going to let that get me down. I wanted to do something productive. I said, I'm going to go get certified. So I literally got two different certifications and I said, I have a lot to offer and people need different help. So I created Positively Jill, which is um, a practice where whether they are cancer patients or cancer survivors, or again, going through a divorce or just look in the mirror and they feel stuck. They're so unhappy where they are. I put together step-by-step programs and techniques for them to get them out. We learn what their dreams really are. Most people don't actually know until they're asked the right questions. And then we build a vision statement of what life should and could look like and we work step by step until they check off each part of that vision statement. Oh, I love that. I love the idea, you know, building a vision statement with your clients, 
really understanding your purpose, why you're here, what you're building towards. That's one of my favorite things to do is to help people to grow and understand their vision. Cause you're right. If you ask most people, like, what do they want out of life? They look at you with like a blank stare. I don't know. They just don't know. Cause we don't teach that. It's even like going back to, you know, you saying when you um, went to college, uh, what did you study for four years? You, did you do four years? Psychology. 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 And then you finish a four-year psychology degree. And like in none of that time, did anyone sit down with you and like actually figure out like, what, what are we going to do with you? Like, and what do you want, Jill? Right. And you said you fell into the job. How many, you know, those that are listening or watching right now, like, I want you to raise your hand if you are still like, not sure what you're going to do. Whether you're in your twenties or your fifties or your seventies, that question is so hard to answer. Uh, I'd love to, uh, just to hear from you a couple of example questions that someone could ask themselves and maybe journal about when they're trying to figure out like this vision or what do they want to do? Yeah. So, it, you know, when I do the vision statement where it becomes really important that it's me or a coach is I don't have that person's fear or in anxiety, right? So the question would be, what makes you happy? Give me a list of your joy list. I want to see on paper, write down everything that brings you joy. It could be as small as drinking coffee, listening to the birds, to as big as traveling around the world, to whatever it is. There's nothing too big or too small. Once I understand what their joy list is and they can say, okay, I understand right then and there, how much of that are they actually doing? How much of that are they actually living? And most people, it's almost non-existent outside of the coffee and the birds and a couple of little things. So um, that's number one. That makes them recognize, wow, I'm not spending even a portion of my day doing things that I like to do. I want to know where, where do they want to live and with whom do they want to live with? That sometimes actually looks different than the scenario <laughs> that they have. <laughs> yep. Uh, I rec- I feel that comment. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a transition. By the time this podcast comes out, we'll have moved from our home that we purchased two and a half years ago with my parents. Because mm. we thought that sharing a home with my parents, they were had a space on the main floor. We were upstairs and going into it, the intention was, you know, that my parents have a place that they could grow old in and all these things. Right. And we would be there for them. And when you, it became clear very quickly that this was not going to be a good situation for either family. So that question actually, I think it's a great question for all of us to just check in, you know, Am I living in the right place? So where, yes, I'm like, I live exactly where I want to live. I live on Vancouver Island off the coast of Canada, west coast of Canada, stunning environment, nature everywhere, but with whom? And a big lesson for me, Jill, in this, the past year and a half has been, I want to live with my husband and my daughter. There you go. Full stop. And you know, Jill, this, this idea of like being able to answer that question, like one of my coaches years ago, he said that when he, uh, he designed his house, he said he didn't build a guest room. He said, because I don't want people staying Mm -hmm. in my home. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Oh, what a boundary that people haven't think thought about very much. So what do you find? Like, do you find sometimes you get like a really like uncomfortable uh, reply from that question? Yeah, sometimes I do, but then I then, then I just ask it for other questions. I don't just let it lie right there. Yeah, that's because so, you're a coach. <laughs> right? So what happened that created that thought process? Yeah. What happened? Do you have a guest there? Tell me about that. Yeah. Right? And then I build other scenarios because that is a limiting mind. That's a limiting belief right there. Obviously, something happened. Something somewhere in his life or her life. Um, okay, so when we start to envision a wonderful guest, somebody who makes you coffee and who picks up for themselves and just feeds, you know, conversation. And then actually I did have somebody who was similar and it turns out that I said, what if she were a beautiful woman? And he says, oh, and then that's no problem. (laughs) Oh, interesting. 
So now I know there's stuff we can work with. He just had a feeling around a certain type of guest who he thought in his own mind, you know, he, he created. These are such good questions. So really, you know, the joy list um, reminds me of something that I do call a when life works list. So very similar. So when life works are like all these things that if I'm doing three to five of this list of 12 in a day, my day works out. And it does include like walking on the beach, watching the sunrise, playing with my dog, hanging out with my daughter, being intimate with my husband, those kind of things. So I love your joy list. I'm going to make sure that I write that in the notes is to really think about those things that are on your joy list. And then the question you said, which was so good, which is well, how many of those are you actually doing? Right. How many are you doing? And what, what, what would it feel like to do all of them. So what, so if you tell me how you feel today, what would your goal be to feel like? So now we know, again, there's a big disconnect between that stuck and the, oh my God, that freedom, that love, that lightness, that rainbow. Okay. Well, we've got work to do and we could get there. That's, that's what they don't, they don't understand. We can get there with the right guidance. You have such good energy, Jill. You, and I love that you're great at asking questions. I think that's like a, a hallmark of an excellent coach is the ability to ask good questions. And like you said, not just leave you hanging, but to able to continue to ask questions and help you to get to exactly what it is that you're looking for. And then, like you said, you walk them step-by-step step on the way. So Jill, um, after people listen to your, your incredible story and you know a little bit about how you work with people, uh, where's the best place for people to connect with you? Um, they can go to my website, which is just positivelyjill.com. Um, they can look for me on Instagram at Positively Jill, um, on Facebook. So they can send me a DM. They can send me an email through the website. It's, um, and what I do is I just really spend 30 to 40 minutes with, with each person just to understand where are they looking to go. And to your earlier point, many of them don't know necessarily. They just know they're not where they want to be. By the way, you know, I've got different, I've got about 15 different questions that I asked. I gave you just a you know, high level example, of but by the end of our conversation, I actually know where they need to go just based on certain questions. And it's also important for me to know, am I working with somebody who is coachable? Many people are not. <laughs> I feel you, my friends. I feel you in that. That's a great point to bring up is that if you're going to make an appointment with a coach, you're going to be coached. <laughs> you have to be yeah. If you want to change, yeah, it, it, it's work. A lot of people don't want to do the work and there are homework assignments that they do through, throughout the week. It's not book reports. It's, it's their own work. It's just, you know, saying, smiling to three extra people in the next seven yeah. days, or giving, which is a big thing. I, I love every single day. I want you to give at least two compliments, whether you see someone on Zoom or you see them at, at the food store, you have to give people compliments. And that's part of a homework assignment because it feels so good. They just don't know it yet because they're not used to saying it or receiving it. Sounds amazing. Jill, I really uh, love your story of, you know, taking something that could have really derailed your life in a negative way. And like you said, could have taken you into depression and feeling sorry for yourself and anxiety, which may have not even had the same health outcomes that you have today. And I look at you, you know, you're a decade uh, outside of this um, and you've really transformed your life. And now you're focused on helping others through your step-by-step -step process to, to manifest and create the life that they choose. So I'm so grateful that you connected with me today on this podcast. Um, as we wrap things up, I would love for you to share one of your favorite, I guess one of your favorite homework exercises. You shared a couple little ones there, but if like, if you could assign all of us a simple homework exercise to help with our mindset, what would that be? Um, okay, so what I would love is to start, when we think about nutrition, it's not just about the food, it's everything. It's the music, it's the people you speak with, it's the TV shows. I would love for people to start to eat the colors of the rainbow start to control at least what goes in, into your into your your body um and i would also love as a homework assignment which i make all my clients do is walk for at least 10 to 30 minutes a day in nature looking up at the sun that's my and favorite just yeah talk to yourself yeah listen to the podcast but that sunlight the vitamins the energy the soulful energy will change you. Oh, that's fantastic. And something that we can all 
do, we can do that right now. Maybe we're already walking while we're listening to the podcast. So pause for a minute, look up at the sky and just breathe in that beautiful energy from the sun and from nature. Jill, thank you so, so much for your time today. It's just been a real joy getting to know you. And thanks for sharing your wisdom and your positivity with us. Thanks so much for having me.